first thing to know about Gordon and Betty Moore is that they're very good people. They're friendly and down to earth. Gordon, good morning. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. And they both have a good sense of humor. Well, it seems to me you two guys have a pretty good time with each other. I mean, this is a, <laughs> most this is of the a, time. <laughs> most of the time. Oh, we have our moments. <laughs> They've actually had many moments together since they first met in college. We got together uh, at a uh, San Jose State function at a Silomar. One of these deals before the start of the school year was orientation or something or other. She said it had to do with student government. I think it had a different orientation for me. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon and Betty were married in 1950. They raised two sons, Ken and Steve. Betty earned a degree in journalism and worked at the Ford Foundation, supporting Gordon while he earned a PhD in chemistry and physics. He started out with explosives when I first met him, so. <laughs> with Betty's support, Gordon moved far beyond explosives. His career included co-founding two legendary Silicon Valley companies. I've been extremely lucky uh, in my career. I got in the semiconductor business just at the right time, just as it was beginning to become commercially viable. Intel changed the world, inventing the microprocessor and becoming the world's largest microchip manufacturer. For his achievements, Gordon has been honored by peers and saluted by presidents. As a result, Gordon and Betty amassed a great fortune, and they earned a reputation for generosity, culminating in the creation of one of America's largest foundations. I guess we can call the meeting to order. In spite of their fame and fortune, they remain unpretentious and grounded in the values they were raised with. I think it's uh, good to give back to society if, if it's at all possible. And I also uh, just feel that um, we have been very lucky in our lives. Life started for both of them on the San Francisco Peninsula. Betty grew up in the small town of Los Garros. Gordon in the smaller town of Pescadero. Pescadero hasn't changed a heck of a lot. I think if you look at towns in California, it's hard to find one that's changed less. In fact, when I describe my hometown, it's often, it's the only town in California that's smaller now than it was 50 years ago. I don't think that's quite right, but oh, it's yes, pretty it close. Is. <laughs> in January 2004, Gordon shared his personal story with Foundation staff on a memorable field trip to the San Mateo coast and his hometown of Pescadero. Uh, I think the, the room I had dinner in tonight is the room that Ron's father used to cut my hair in when he ran a barber shop here. Uh, uh, when you go outside and you look up the street a little ways, you see a very tall palm tree with a bunch of vines growing on the side. That palm tree is about 50 foot taller than it was when I lived there, but that's the house I lived in when I lived in Pescadero. Gordon's ancestors came to California two years before the gold rush and settled in Pescadero in 1852. Both of his parents were born here. We lived on this side of the street. Uh, my grandfather had a store directly across Behind that, we had our cow. The, you know, that was part of living in a place like this. It, uh, you could have your cow close by. <laughs> Gordon's father was a lawman. William Moore was a San Mateo County Sheriff's deputy who began his law enforcement career as the lone constable for the entire San Mateo coast. Its remote location kept Pescadero isolated from the bustling nearby worlds of San Francisco and San Jose. It was a community that, um, you know, was sort of on its own. And, um, uh, you know, and even today, if you look at Pescadero, it looks a lot like it did in the 19th century. I would think that a lot of the attitudes and a lot of the feeling of the place in the 30s uh, when Gordon was growing up probably, you know, felt like still being back in the Old West. It's ironic that a boy from a 19th century town 
would grow up to have such a profound impact on life in the 21st century. Gordon uh, is one of those, uh, you know, one of the big ones, right? The, the big, the big uh, figures of the semiconductor industry. In 1956, Gordon accepted an invitation from Nobel laureate William Shockley to join his team researching semiconductors. We couldn't figure out whether he was a chemist or a physicist or a physical chemist or a chemical physicist, but that was always one of the questions going around at the time. What did he think he was? Well, he was... Uh, he was changing his mind all the time, and sometimes he would call himself one or the other. Whatever he called himself, Gordon impressed his colleagues. Seven of them joined him in 1957 to start Fairchild Semiconductor. Together, they brought the first integrated circuit to market. His skill lay in the fact that he could recognize the practicality and the utility of a new product and still convince others, especially those working with him, that it was achievable. In 1968, Gordon and Bob Noyce co-founded Intel and soon produced the world's first microprocessor, considered one of the most important inventions of the 20th century. During my career, I've seen uh, the industry move from the point where uh, we made single transistors to the point where we now make uh, memory chips with 250 million bits on them uh, and sell them for about the same price. Uh, the cost reductions have been phenomenal and that's what's really allowed electronics to enter everybody's lives and personal computers, PDA, cell phones and so forth. This phenomenal decrease in the cost of doing things electronically. Gordon is perhaps best known as the author of Moore's Law, an observation which states that the density of transistors on a microchip doubles every 18 months. It started so simply, it was an empirical observation, it was not a mathematical calculation, it was not based on any deep and profound science other than the development of better processes, and I think that's the key. Gordon was a superb process developer. While Moore's law applied to the semiconductor industry, it had an impact on popular culture too, helping Pixar predict the birth of computer animation. And sure enough, about the time Moore's law predicted we should be able to make a cost-effective movie, Disney knocked on our door and says, well, let's do it. And we did it, Toy Story. That's what Moore's law means to me. I've never met the man, but that rule of the, the heuristic or a rule of thumb or whatever it is that we call a law has been a very effective predictor of the future and is what we based our, a lot of our decisions on, coming, bringing the computer graphics industry into existence. Uh, for a long time I found it uh, embarrassing or something to use the term Moore's Law. First of all, it wasn't a law and uh, I didn't really uh, know that uh, it was going to be something that would continue. Gordon is a quiet man whose achievements have thrust him into the spotlight. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honored. It's a special. He's often been in the company of world leaders and in 2002 was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Yeah, I used to come down here and oh, hunt deer occasionally. Uh, but fame has yeah. never diminished Gordon's modesty a fact illustrated by this anecdote comparing Gordon's arrival at an industry event with that of a flashier colleague. Jerry Sanders, who was um, head of AMD, he's a very flamboyant guy and, and uh, he always made a statement where we went, pulled up in the big stretch limousine, a couple of girls with him, got out and waved to the crowd, somebody picked up his bags, he went inside the, the, uh, the hotel and, and um, like he was a rock star. The very next cab pulled up behind him, it was a yellow cab, Gordon and Betty got out. Gordon picked up his bags and walked in. And that was the difference between Gordon and a lot of other people in the industry. He was uh, a little Harry Truman-esque, if you will. Uh, but he, uh, he always carried his own bags. And that one turned out to work just right. I call this our Goldilocks strategy. You know, one was too easy, one was too hard, and one was just right. And, uh, we had the success no of Intel generated great wealth, which Gordon and Betty have always shared generously. 
In September 2000, they founded the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Well, we thought we had an opportunity that uh, maybe we could do something that would have a significant impact on uh, the world. Uh, and really, that's what was attractive, uh, to do something that was permanent and hopefully on a large scale. The foundation works in areas of great importance to its founders. Gordon's interest in science and higher education stems from his own career. And for them both, a lifelong love of the outdoors, especially fishing, fueled a concern for environmental conservation. Actually, we used to go on fishing dates before we got married. This sounds really weird. But, <laughs> but I always enjoyed trout fishing or fishing off the pier at Santa Cruz. I mean, being a Los Gatos girl just over the hill. It's been a wonderful thing, and all the fishes live in the most beautiful spots in the world. They do. Gordon and Betty have supported the preservation of many of those places, including their beloved San Mateo Coast. Betty's personal experiences and her long history of supporting hospitals and volunteering in nursing homes spurred the creation of an innovative program to expand and improve the nursing profession. It's because of Betty's compassion and vision to improve nursing care that, that really resulted in the creation of um, our nursing initiative. The Betty Irene Moore Nursing Initiative seeks to find innovative solutions to a critical and growing shortage of nurses. And you, Mrs. Moore, you are making such a tremendous impact with your generosity. Because of you, we're going to have more faculty. Because of you, we'll have more nursing students. Because of you, we'll have more nurses at the bedside. And because of you, a child will go home and celebrate his birthday. And because of you, a dying child will have a nurse to hold his hand. So thank you. I thank you for our profession. I thank you for the kids. And it means so much to me to be able to be part of the solution to our nursing crisis. Thank you so much. Gordon and Betty Moore have led quite a life together, and they're not even close to being finished. They're determined to help solve some of the world's great problems by supporting people who are dedicated to being part of the solution. And they do it all with grace, humility, and a sense of humor. All things considered, that's quite a legacy for a couple of kids from down on the peninsula. <laughs>